Hallo, schön, dass du da bist, hier beim Podcast Happy, Holy and Confident, deinem Podcast fürs Herz und den Verstand. Mein Name ist Laura Marlina Seiler und ich freue mich so sehr, heute ein Interview mit dir teilen zu können mit einer Frau, die mich dieses Jahr auf eine ganz besondere Art und Weise begleitet hat. Und zwar war ich ja in Maui die Hälfte des Jahres und bin immer zum Surfen gefahren. Und im Auto, diese 20 Minuten im Auto, die ich dann hatte, habe ich immer ein Hörbuch gehört und zwar von Glennon Doyle Untamed. Das Buch ist jetzt gerade auch in Deutschland erschienen, heißt auf Deutsch Ungezähmt. Und ich liebe, liebe, liebe dieses Buch. Ich habe mich so sehr auf die Zeit im Auto gefreut, wo ich immer weiter gehört habe. Bin manchmal sogar noch länger im Auto sitzen geblieben, weil ich unbedingt wissen wollte, wie es weitergeht. Und habe mir so sehr gewünscht, sie zu interviewen. Sie ist Number One New York Times Bestseller Autorin. Sie ist Aktivistin. Sie ist einfach eine fantastische Frau, eine tolle Autorin, ein wundervoller Mensch. Unglaublich inspirierend und Umso mehr freue ich mich, dass ich sie jetzt interviewen konnte und das Interview mit ihr teilen darf, indem es vor allem darum geht, wie wichtig es ist, sich über die eigenen Konditionierungen bewusst zu werden und über die Käfige, die wir uns teilweise selbst in unserem Leben bauen oder in die wir irgendwann einsteigen und dann denken, es wäre normal, in diesem Käfig zu leben. Und es geht auch darum, sich zu erlauben, wirklich wahrhaftig wieder zu der eigenen Natur zurückzukehren man selbst zu sein in der eigenen Einzigartigkeit. Und das Spannende an Glennons Geschichte ist, dass sie, ich glaube, zwölf Jahre lang verheiratet war, drei Kinder mit ihrem Mann hat. Und dann gab es den Tag, wo sie auf einer Buchvorlesung war und eine Frau reinkommt und sie sich in diese Frau verliebt. Und wie die Geschichte weitergeht, erzähle ich jetzt nicht, weil darüber sprechen wir im Interview. Aber es ist einmal eine... Eine so inspirierende Geschichte auf der Suche nach der eigenen Wahrheit, nach der eigenen Authentizität und danach dem eigenen Herzen zu folgen und sich loszulösen von all dem, was wir meinen, was von uns erwartet wird, wie wir zu sein haben, wie wir sein sollen und uns zu erlauben, wirklich wahrhaftig wir selbst zu sein. Und ich wünsche dir unglaublich viel Freude mit diesem Gespräch. Es ist auf Englisch, du findest natürlich wie immer die deutschen Untertitel auf YouTube, auf meinem Blog, da kannst du einfach mitlesen. Aber Glennon ist auch super gut zu verstehen. Und hör dir das Interview unbedingt an. Teile es natürlich auch gerne. Und wie immer freue ich mich, wenn du bei Instagram at Laura Marlina Seiler danach vorbeischaust und mir deine Gedanken zu der Folge da lässt. Da würde ich mich riesig drüber freuen. Und die aller, allerbesten Neuigkeiten sind zum einen, Freunde der Sonne, es wird wieder den Selbstliebe-Adventskalender geben. Jetzt schon, ich glaube, im vierten Jahr oder im fünften, ich weiß gar nicht. Also auf jeden Fall gab es den jetzt schon öfters von mir und zwar sind das im Dezember 24 Sprachnachrichten, die du von mir bekommst, jeden Morgen von mir frisch aufgenommen äh, mit Inspiration zur Selbstliebe und in diesem Jahr gibt es eine ganz besondere Überraschung dazu und zwar wird es meine eigene App geben. Es ist so aufregend und in dieser App wird es auch den Adventskalender geben, damit da wirklich jeder darauf Zugriff hat. Es ist kostenlos und du kannst dich jetzt quasi auf die Warteliste schreiben, damit du Bescheid bekommst, wenn die App verfügbar ist. Und dann kannst du dir da dann den Adventskalender anhören und natürlich die ganze App auch entdecken, die wirklich so wunderschön wird. Aber dazu später noch mehr. Das ist das eine. Den Link dazu findest du natürlich in den Show Notes. Und das andere ist, dass ich am 24.11. um 19 Uhr endlich mal wieder ein Live-Webinar geben werde. Ein Live-Online-Training zu dem Thema, wie man blockierende Glaubenssätze und Überzeugungen auflöst und wie du in Kontakt kommst mit deinem Unterbewusstsein und da wirklich deine innere Kraft und Schöpferkraft aktivierst und Frieden schließt mit deiner Vergangenheit, um vollkommen bewusst, aktiv, positiv und klar im Hier und Jetzt zu sein, um dir eine Zukunft erschaffen zu können, die du dir wirklich wünschst. Und dieses Online-Training ist auch kostenlos. Du kannst dich jetzt dafür anmelden. Den Link dazu findest du natürlich auch in den Show Notes. Und es ist immer wieder so eine schöne Erfahrung in den Online-Trainings, weil einfach tausende, tausende von Menschen mit dabei sind und da natürlich immer eine ganz besondere Energie entsteht. Deswegen freue ich mich natürlich, wenn du auch dabei bist. Also 24.11. tragst dir in den Kalender ein, melde dich an und es ist kostenlos. Ich freue mich auf dich. Und jetzt geht es los. Mit dem Interview mit Glennon Doyle. Ich wünsche dir unglaublich viel Freude dabei. Viel Spaß, deine Laura.
I am so excited and grateful to have this wonderful, amazing, inspiring woman in the conversation today, Glennon Doyle. Thank you so much for taking your time and being here with me. Thank you. I am honored. I am honored to be here. And um, yeah, you just said it's election week right now in the States. How are you doing? I mean, I think it's crazy right now. <laughs> How am I doing? Wow. I am just trying. I feel like I'm walking on a path and I there's a cliff of despair to the left and a cliff of hope to the right. And I'm just trying to stay on the path and keep getting people Debated. I'm just using every single bit of my voice and platform and um, privilege to get Trump out of office. And and I'm afraid to be hopeful, but um, but I still am. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have to tell you, I um, I live half of the year in, in Maui or a lot of time I spend with my family in Hawaii. And every time I go surfing this year when I've been there, I've been during entire lockdown, I've been on Maui. And I um, was kind of with you there because I was listening to Untamed <laughs> always when I was in the car, when I was driving and um, because I had to drive from one, one side from the island to the other side of the island to go surfing there and I was always listening uh, to Untamed and it was so beautiful because this were like my 25 hours I had for myself because I, my son wasn't with me so I was just in the car you and me I was listening and um, I just have to tell you I love the book it's it's amazing it's beautiful beautiful it's powerful and um, there has been one part in the I mean there are so many but there has been one part in the book where you would talk about two different languages that we learn so there's this one language we are born with and there's one language we kind of learn so I would just like to maybe start into the conversation about your book um, Untamed in Germany it's called Ungezähmt for all those <laughs> who, who want to read it in German. Um, so maybe we can start talking about this. What are the languages, especially we women, are, are born with? And what is the language we, we are getting taught? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, it is the case that we are born sort of these wild, individualistic um free selves, right? We're born and most of us have a few good years of childhood that we just kind of live from our emotion and our intuition and our imagination. And then social scientists tell us that somewhere from the age of seven to, to 12, usually, we start to really internalize our formal kind of conditioning, right? What that means is that we are told who we are. Okay, we are said we are told you're a girl and this is how girls act, right? <clears throat> you're a Christian and this is how Christians believe, right? You're a American, you're a Doyle in my case, you're a this and this and this. And 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 we start to try to fit into those categories because each category has rules, right? So if you're a girl, You need to, you know, for the way that I grew up, you're a girl in this culture, you need to be quiet and accommodating and pleasing and pretty and smile and kind. And um, and so what happens is that over time, we start to abandon ourselves, our true selves, to fit inside these categories, right? And I can tell that a woman is relying on her conditioning, on her indoctrination, when she uses words with me like can't or should, or supposed to, right? Even right and wrong. I mean, I learned when I was um, trying to figure out what to do in the wake of the infidelity in my last marriage, I had a really interesting experience because I didn't know what to do. I did not know what to do. And what I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know. And, and all I knew was that back then that I was just trying to make everybody happy, right? I was just trying to do the right thing, whatever the hell that is. And I started noticing in, in America, I live in this um, interesting Venn diagram where part of my community, part of who I am is a faith 
community. It's kind of Christian-y, right? And then the other half of my community or who I am is fiercely feminist, okay? And that is a strange Venn diagram to, to live inside of. So what I noticed is that all of the people from my christian religious camp were telling me that the right thing to do, that what a good woman would do, that what a strong mother would do is to stay in that marriage. And all of my fiercely feminist friends were telling me that the right thing to do, what a good woman would do, what a strong woman would do is leave. And so, and, and they were all telling the truth from their being, right? And what, it, what that was such a gift to me because it became so clear that, oh, there is no right and wrong. There is no good and bad. There is no should or supposed to, that these are not pure ideas. These are all culturally constructed ideas, right? These are the barking sheepdogs that keep the masses in the herd because what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, what a woman should do is completely different in this camp than it is in this camp, right? So that's when I realized, oh, I literally can't please everybody. That is a gift, right? When you finally realize, finally realizes she can't please everybody is when she decides, oh, what the hell? I might as well please myself then, right? So really what I had to do in that, in that moment is figure out, okay, all of these people are talking about right, wrong, should, shouldn't. These are not pure concepts. And if I keep following other idea, other people's ideas of right and wrong and good and should, I'm going to live somebody else's life. I've got to figure out how to find the pure concept, right? For me. And what I figured out is that when people use those words, when people say you should, a woman is supposed to, a Christian has to, a mother can't, those words can't, should, supposed to, right, wrong. Those are all the language of indoctrination. Those are the bars of our cages, of our social constructs, of our categories we've been put into, which are categories of gender, of sexuality, of reality. What I think is a beautiful exercise is when a woman comes to me and is using that, that language, I always think of my job as to help her bridge, to build a bridge between the indoctrination of the mind to the imagination of the soul, right? There is there is our language of indoctrination that tells us it's an excuse maker, right? I want that, but I can't, but I can't, but I should, but I shouldn't. That's the language of indoctrination. And I've noticed this beautiful thing that when I say to a woman, okay, 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 I hear you, you can't, you should, you're supposed to. Can you tell me a story about the truest, most beautiful marriage you can imagine? Can you tell me a story about the truest, most beautiful family you can imagine, community you can imagine, career you can imagine, world you can imagine? This amazing thing happens 100% of the time, which is that the what ridiculously, you know, hamster wheel polluted mind quiets down and this story rises up in every woman. Every woman seems to have this blueprint in her imagination of the kind of true and beautiful life she was made for. And the most beautiful thing in the world is to actually see that indoctrination quiet down and see this story unfold, which I believe is the marching orders for every woman. So beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, I mean, you are the living proof, <laughs> sort of, of what happens when you connect to your purest self. Because, I mean, uh, you kind of changed everything who you are or who you thought you have to be into who you are. And um, I, I love also the passage uh, in your book when you are at this book event. And I think you promote the book about the reconciliation is the right word. I don't know, with your husband. And then you meet Abby. <laughs> And um, I remember being in my car and I, I kept being sitting uh, in the car to keep listening because I just wanted to know what would happen next because I was like, please <laughs> give her your number. <laughs> uh <-oh>. Do something. <laughs> I was so excited. And um, 
Yeah, so maybe you can uh, you can talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, you've been married uh, to a man uh, for, I don't know actually for how long, but probably at least 10 years or something or... 12 years. 12, 12 years. years. You have three children together, three children together. Um, and then you go to an event and then the, the woman comes in and you just go like, oh, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> so um, maybe you can take us a little bit into your inner world. I mean, this, this must have been like a crash of everything you thought what life is. And then there comes Abby. <laughs> So, That's right. Yeah. Well, I had, I had kind of a stirring inside of me previously. You know, I I was in what I would call a broken marriage to a good man, and that is a really hard place for a woman to be because we're supposed to just be grateful for good enough, right? We we tell ourselves, "Oh, I can't have it all. Like this is okay. This is good enough. I'm supposed to be grateful. I should be a good woman. Would be happy for what she has." And we had made, you know, we had gone through infidelity and we had done everything that we're supposed to do to recover from that. You know, the therapy, the prayer, the every bit of, of advice we've been given. And I was just kind of, we had our good moments, you know, but I just always still felt angry is really the best way to describe it. I just, no matter what I did, I couldn't shake this kind of low level river of rage that I had all the time, which was lovely for all of us. Um, and I just always had this, like, this wondering, this nagging, this yearning, this question of, you know, wasn't it supposed to be more beautiful than this? Like, isn't love supposed to be more beautiful than this? But I just ignored all of that because that's what women do, right? We just deny and pretend and, you know, numb all of that. Anyway. So I wrote a book, my, my second memoir was about, was called Love Warrior. And it was about the infidelity and the kind of reconstruction of our marriage. And so when I put that out, it became a really big deal. And Oprah picked it for her book club and every, everybody was calling it an epic marriage redemption story, right? So at the first event to promote this epic marriage redemption story, I'm sitting at this table, table full of writers, of other writers who are releasing books. And we're all trying to make small talk, which writers are terrible at. And the room gets quiet. And I look over at the door and there's this woman standing in the door. And she is just like, I don't know. I'd never seen a human being that looked like her before. She was like 12 feet tall. And she had this platinum hair and it was like shaved on the sides and long on the top. And she just, I don't know, she looked like, a man and a woman and a beyond gender and, and everybody staring because she was this a way too cool of a human to be at our nerdy book party. Right. It was just very confusing for all of us. And I just, in the weirdest moment of my entire life, I just felt this knowing of, Oh, there she is. There she is. And yes, I have no idea what the hell there she is means. Like I've never dated a woman before in my life. I've never kissed a woman before in my life. I am married with three children. I am on the road promoting my marriage redemption book. I have no idea what this means. We, I have this very awkward moment where there's no awkward moment that I can't make more awkward. That's like my spiritual gift. And so I found myself at the table standing up and I threw my arms open. The hell I was doing in that moment. It was like, I lost control. Like I just couldn't contain myself anymore. And, and so then I'm standing up with my arms wide open and now everybody in the room, including Abby in the doorway is staring at me because this is so <laughs> weird. So then I panic because I don't know how to make this not be happening. So then, and this is like my family joke for the rest of our lives. I actually bowed because I thought, <laughs> I thought the only way to get through this is to pretend that this is something I do when people <laughs> walk into the room. And so still, Laura, in my family, when, when everyone wants to make fun of me, they stand up and bow when people walk in the room. Like it, till the day I die, people will be making fun of me for that. It was the weirdest thing. 
I mean, Abby was like, what is wrong with this woman? Like, what is happening? And then we had five minutes together, maybe three minutes together. I don't know, when we walked from that little room to the big convention room where we were giving our speeches. And for some reason in that few minutes, Abby really just poured herself out to me. She was struggling a lot. She was just retired. She's an Olympic real famous soccer player in our country. And she was retiring from that. She was going through all, all kinds of hard things with addiction. And, and she just told all of it to me. And Laura, I was so excited because I wanted so badly to make a good impression, but I was so nervous. And in that three minutes, she asked me about addiction, shame, writing, because her book, and I was like, oh my God, these are my three things. Like, <laughs> these are the things I know about. Like, how lucky can I be? So we had this very beautiful, incredible conversation. And then we went on with our evening and left each other. And all I can tell you is that we both left that night knowing that some sort of ridiculous lightning had struck between us. And systematically over the next six months, we both just totally disassembled our lives so that we could be together. And we actually never saw each other again until we had disassembled our entire lives for the chance to be together. It was incredible. It was the weirdest, most unexpected moment and happening in my entire life. And it was so wonderful to be a 42 year old woman and to be like, wow, life surprised me at 42. Like my love life began at 42. So crazy. So, so awesome. Amazing. It's it's thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I yeah, I'm I'm really so so excited for you also that I mean you got married, you're really happy now, you figured everything out, and it's just so beautiful because I think you're really the proof how important it is to to be stronger than your pain, to be stronger than than your your doubts to be stronger than what you think you are supposed to do and to really, really follow this intuition, your, your gut feeling. And I mean, I can, can't imagine something more difficult than to be in a Christian surrounding and tell the people, um, okay, so <laughs> next step is... <laughs> like, it wasn't just the Christians, which they're, they're scary, but like it was... My job, I mean, all of these people who were depending on the success of this book, Love Warrior, were telling me over and over again, like, you cannot do this, or you at least can't do it out loud, right? Mm -hmm. The book will tank, your future will tank, your community will abandon you. This, this, I mean, I remember somebody that I respect and love on my team looking at me and saying, this is career suicide, you know? And me thinking, well, I would rather enter career suicide than soul suicide, right? Mm -hmm. Like I really, it wasn't just an, an, an issue of love. It wasn't just an issue of, will I go with Abby or will I stay in my broken marriage? It was, will I abandon myself? Like it felt like a life or death situation. Like I had finally heard from a self that had been buried underneath people's expectations and ideals and the roles I played in the world. And I had finally heard from my real self, you know, the self that I was before the world told me who to be. And it felt like, okay, will I abandon the world's expectations of me so I can finally honor myself? Or will I abandon myself so I can honor the world's expectations of me? Mm. And when you think about it that way, it's like, even though it's scary, it's scary to go against what people expect you to do. It's scarier to never live your one true and beautiful life. That's what's the scariest, right? Is to live your entire life and lay on your deathbed and ask yourself, why didn't I allow myself to live? Right? So the year that followed was in no way easy. You know, it's like, I think it's easy to look at, at our life right now because we do have this wild and wonderful family and my ex-husband and I co-parent in a very cool way. Like we all really do love and respect each other. 
And it can look like, wow, it just all turned out. But like, it was a year of pain and, and scary things and I, and divorce, which is so hard on kids and, you know, all of it, it was, it was hard. Um, and it was the right kind of hard finally, yeah. you know, how there's just kind of wrong kind of hard, mm-hmm. which is just this slow abandonment of yourself. And then there's the right kind of hard where you do rock the boat and you even hurt people. But in the end, it's like when you grant yourself the freedom to live truly and beautifully, the, the most amazing part of that is that you start to grant permission for all of the people in your life to do the same. And so it's not just that now I ended up with a true and beautiful life. It's that my kids saw how that's done, right? They now know that they can disappoint me and, and that it's in, and it is their, actually their job to disappoint me so that they never disappoint themselves, mm. right? Wow. So in the end, we are all truer and more beautiful for the decisions that were made. Um, but that is not to say that it was smooth sailing. <laughs> no, I, I, I can imagine. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've been a few times in America and I mean, the States are even more, um, I think even more into gender roles than maybe yes. in Germany. It's very, yeah. very, I, I, me, every time I'm, I'm in the States, I'm, I'm, I don't know, surprised or how much women are in this, what you said, like I, how I have to be as a woman. In Germany, I think we there's maybe a little bit, bit more of freedom. I don't know if really it's like this, but I, I have the feeling, especially here in Berlin, <laughs> everybody is just how they want to be. So I'm jealous. I'm yeah, jealous. Maybe that's where I need to be. <laughs> yeah, you can come by any time when this crazy whatever out there is over. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I can imagine especially, I mean, I've, I have a son and um, you have three children and I can imagine how it is to to tell your children as well that, that you're getting divorced and that something will change, especially, I mean, how old have they been? Like 10, 12, something that, that age? Yeah. Yeah. So we were 13, 10 and eight. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, it's it, exactly the same age I've been when my parents got divorced. Exactly really? the same. I've been 10. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, it's uh, a hard thing. It's hard. It's a hard thing. Yeah. So yeah, every time I, every time they're going over to their dad's house, I mean, I'm supremely ridiculously lucky in the fact that they have just this incredible father who's just never, I mean, he just adores them and lives for them. And that is so lucky. So I don't have the fear that some of my friends do when my kids leave that, that they're not in good hands. Yeah. That is, that's, that's a tough one. But I still, every time they go and I see their little bags in the foyer, I feel sad, you know, I feel sad for them. And then I just have to remind myself that something can be hard. It can be hard and still be exactly right. And you just know? to also give you some perspective, sort of, because I mean, I've been there and I'm now 34 and I always say it has been one of the hardest things in my life, but the best thing that could ever happen. Because only therefore I am who I am today. And I'm pretty sure that your children will see it exactly the same way. So you, you don't want to live in a lie for your children. Because I think that is the biggest hurt you can do towards your own children. One of my favorite quotes is the Carl Jung quote that says, the greatest burden that a child can bear is the unlived life of a parent. Oh, yeah. 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 I think about that all the time, you know, so putting a child through divorce is, is a tough decision to, to make, but so is staying and modeling mm -hmm. bad luck. That's true. What do you think helped your children during this phase? Like when you told them in this year of, of being really honest, and I mean, I can imagine it has been also a big change for them to see their mother all of a sudden starting to be herself and, yeah. um, What do you think helped them also getting through this um, yeah, time of, of their life? I think knowing them um, well enough to, to understand how differently each of the three would go through it. Mm. You know, I, had, I have one, my middle child, who's really extremely sensitive. She's like I am. And she, let's just say she does not suffer silently. Mm. <laughs> she just... <laughs> Every feeling. I mean, we talk about our feelings 10 hours a freaking day, every day, just endless, endless. It was like 
it was like she was Joan of Arc just every day, just leading us towards the pain, just not letting us get over it. You know, it was just, and then we had another one who was really quiet and acted out a little bit, you know, and then we had a third one who didn't want to talk about anything. I remember she was little and I remember saying, honey, we have to talk about your feelings. And she said, I don't know where they are. Oh, oh God. Ooh, maybe some therapy. Yeah. So I think really allowing each kid to experience it differently, to walk through it their own way. Because I'm a highly sensitive person, I was very careful to never try to steal their pain from them, to never try to make it seem like it was better than it was, to just mm-hmm. let it be as painful as it was and let them have their pain. Um, I think that's probably what helped us most is just to not try to tidy it up, to not mm-hmm. try to make um to not try to make it seem easier than it was and to just let everybody feel all of it until, until they were ready to heal. That's beautiful. Thank you. And the, the last question I have before I ask the very last question <laughs> is, um, have you been, have you been nervous before you published the book and how did you deal with, with this maybe also fear of, of sharing your experience and everything with the world? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I think there's a little bit of of jitteriness, like, will people like it? Will they get it? Will they? There's all of that. But in terms of the vulnerability of it, that part wasn't as bad for me because I've been practicing it for so long. So my, um, the most important thing to me in the entire world is my sobriety. So I got sober when I was 25. I've been sober for, wow, 19 years now. And, um, I learned in early sobriety that the only way for me, I don't know if it's for everyone, but the only way for me to live with any peace is to have no shame, right? That's what I learned in the recovery, um, that I really have to not have secrets. I can have privacy, but I can't have secrets. And a secret to me is uh, privacy is when you have something precious and beautiful and you want to keep it to yourself, Mm -hmm. right? And a secret is when you have something like that feels dirty and heavy and scary and you want to keep it to yourself. Right. So when I have something that feels scary and heavy, I know that I have to share it because shame, secrecy is, I think, the only threat to my sobriety that I can imagine in the world at this point. So it's not just like I'm a writer. So I write those things. It's like I was living that way even before I wrote. You know, I, um, have, it's a kind of a spiritual practice for me to not have secrets to remind myself over and over again, that I'm not bad. I'm just human. And that there's no thought that I've had. There's no experience that I've had. There's no mistake I've made that a million other people haven't made. Right. That I'm just not that special. (laughs) That's, that's the most important thing to me. So, so while untamed is, is some people can't believe how, open um it is to me it's just a way of life right um i can't do it any other way so when there's no other choice it feels less scary hiding anything feels scary to me that feels more scary um but still i i think because in some ways it's such a specific book there's a narrative in it that's so that's about falling in love with a woman and i think i've just been surprised by how universal like The fact that so many women are finding themselves in it in so many different circumstances, that is surprising to me. Yeah. Well, it's, I just told my assistant um, today that, like, really, it's, it's one of the best books I've, I've ever written. Seriously. It's so honest. It's so pure. It's so healing. It's so... Every chapter, yeah, was just amazing so just thank you for writing it and i'm so happy that it will be in german so that so many people can read it and um, me too yeah it's amazing so i know you 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 have to go so i have one last question um really the last one so imagine um it's the last day of your life okay you live a beautiful long 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 life you get really old and you have grand grandchildren And then I would come to you and I would say, Glennon, I'm so sorry. There has been a technical problem and everything you ever wrote is deleted. It's all gone. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, <laughs> I know. Oh, <laughs> but no. <laughs> but um, I would tell you, I have a white sheet of paper and a pen. And if everything you've ever said, done, written is gone, what would be three wisdoms from you that you would like the world to remember if this would be all you could leave? Well, first of all, I would not be thinking about the world at that moment. I would only be thinking about my wife and three kids. That's what I thought of right away. It's like, what would I want them to know? Um, because I think that secretly everything that I write is really what I want my kids to have when, when they are like, what did my mom want me to know? What does my mom, what is my mom leaving me with? You know, untamed, I really wrote for Tish. Um, so, you know, if it were the world, I'd be saying we can do hard things. We belong to each other, all of those. Um, but what I really want, I think what all of my writing comes down to, what everything that I tell my kids comes down to is just two things, which is you are deeply loved. And so are they. Whoever they is, right? You are deeply loved, and so is everyone else. Um, I think that the biggest struggles in my life have come when I've tried to change myself to fit other people's expectations, or when I've tried to change other people to fit my expectations, <laughs> right? And so I think the greatest freedom and peace, because that's what I would be wanting to offer to my kids, freedom and peace in that moment. And I think the way that I would do that is to promise them that they are perfect and beloved exactly as they are. And so is everybody else. Beautiful. Lennon, thank you so much. Um, thank you for being you. Thank you for being so honest. Thank you for being so powerful and so brave and just the perfect example actually of being a woman I think I'm I'm so inspired by your being and by everything you do and I really honestly mean that and I wish you from the bottom of my heart the best best possible life you can have for you and your family and um, I hope that one day maybe we meet in person and until then um, yeah just all the best for you for your book for Abby your children everyone you love and um, thank you for this beautiful conversation Wow, Laura, I've loved every minute of this. I love your spirit. I love your being. Thank you for this conversation. And yes, I hope we get to go surfing together someday. You can teach me how to surf. That would be amazing. I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. So um, blessings from Berlin to actually you're in LA or which city are you in? I'm actually in Florida right now. In, in Florida. 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 Okay, perfect. Yeah. So you have yeah. sun, we have snow. <laughs> um, I Fingers crossed that... No, um, but hopes and dreams that, Laura, uh, that uh, America makes the right choice <laughs> yeah. if not But, I might be moving yeah. to Berlin so. yeah. okay. thank you Laura <laughs> take care, bye bye Glennon bye bye, thank you ich hoffe, dass dir diese Folge sehr gut gefallen hat, dass du ganz viel Inspiration daraus für dich mitnehmen konntest und das Gefühl und die innere Erlaubnis, wie wertvoll und wichtig es ist, dir zu erlauben, deine eigene Wahrheit zu leben. Und auch das ist manchmal nicht leicht, ich weiß. Und es macht uns manchmal Angst, aber am Ende ist es das, was uns selbst befreit. Und ich hoffe, dass dich diese Folge dazu inspiriert hat, in Kontakt zu kommen, auch mit dem, was dir dein Herz sagt und dir zu erlauben, deinen eigenen Erwartungen zu folgen und nicht denen von anderen. Und wie gesagt, Schau bei mir bei Instagram vorbei, at Laura Marlina Seiler und unter dem Post von heute. Erzähl mir gerne, was du aus dieser Folge für dich mitgenommen hast, was dich bewegt hat, was dich inspiriert hat. Und ich freue mich da riesig auf die Kommentare. Und am 24.11. unbedingt eintragen, gibt es ein kostenloses Live-Online-Training mit mir. Ich freue mich so sehr, wenn du dabei bist. Das wird wunderschön werden. Wir werden meditieren. Ich werde dir Input geben. Es wird ein Q&A geben. Und ja, sei dabei. Und es wird auch wieder den Adventskalender geben ab Dezember kostenlos in meiner App mit wunderschönen, inspirierenden Sprachnachrichten. Es sind so wie so Mini-Baby-Podcasts jeden Tag für dich. <lacht> so kannst du es dir vorstellen. Alle Infos dazu in den Shownotes und natürlich auch immer auf meiner Webseite. 
Und ich wünsche dir jetzt einen wunderschönen Tag, fühl dich von Herzen umarmt, es ist so schön, dass es dich gibt, glaub an dich, glaub an dich, glaub an dich, egal wo du gerade stehst, was auch immer gerade in deinem Leben ist, du schaffst das, du kannst das und aus unseren manchmal schwierigsten Momenten wird immer unsere größte Stärke und unser größtes Licht geboren. Also geh weiter, glaub an dich und bring dein Licht in die Welt. Rock on und Namaste, deine Laura.